Welcome to Living the Reclaim Life podcast. I'm Denisha. We're glad you're here for conversations that revive hope, inspire healing, and encourage you to live a vibrant life with Christ. So grab a cup of coffee as we chat with today's guest. We are so excited to bring you back to part two with Robin Blumenthal. We appreciate so much the experience that Robin gave us. If you missed the last episode, be sure to go back and catch episode 15. Robin is a wife, a mom of five kids. She could just teach on parenting all day long, let me tell you. Uh, Robin was in full-time ministry. And she uh, left full-time ministry to become a trainer, a speaker, and an author and a coach. So Robin, we are so excited to have you back. I'm so glad to be back, Denisha. Had so much fun last week. I'm glad we're doing it again. It was so good. It was so good. If you missed last week's episode, I'm telling you, go back and check it out. We talked about our perspective and during COVID, just how much our perspective of other people and opinions and all of the tension that we're facing in our daily lives. And we talked about how to create a safe place to be that place that other people can come to and sort of take refuge and just to how to hold that space for them to, to be that place that they can come to. And I love when you talked about people are doing the best they can. And we need to not only look at others as they're experiencing life and, and we watch them that know that they're doing the best they can, but to also give ourselves that benefit that we are doing the best we can, even if we think, oh, I should have done this or I should have done that, those shoulds you know, that we all live in, but that in that there's so much that came out when it came to relationships and just the tension that we feel. So I'd love to dive into that today with you, just the tensions that we feel in relationships. And you did a fantastic job on your book. Robin wrote a children's book called Where in the Zoo Are You? And it is amazing for children to just sort of find their place and learn how to interact with other people relationally. Uh, So if you want, in case somebody missed the last episode, if you want to talk a little bit about your book and we can talk about the tension that we have in relationships. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Now, Where in the Zoo Are You is a story of a fictional flood that happens and the animals in the zoo are all affected differently. The zookeepers can't go in for like 10 days. So they're very worried about the animals and they learn that they have to take care of themselves first before they go in, uh, much like as COVID, right? Where yeah. where uh, educators and people um, who are used to being hands-on have had to really do things a little differently. And also um, with the animals, trauma is really about how we each perceive it. So it's about what happened to us but it's also about how we perceived what happened to us. So when you think of the animals, for example, Max, the tiger is very angry because he likes his world predictable and he takes it out on the zookeepers, right? Uh, Not hurting them, but just, you know, roaring and being angry. And they have to learn that it's not personal, that Max has just had his world disrupted and this is how he's responding. So they have to come to him with uh, empathy. And so the book asks questions that kids can talk about with their families or in their classrooms or whatever, just to talk about different, how they're doing emotionally and how they would help the animals. So that kind of brings me to the question about relationships. So many of us, we, we want to be there for other people. We want to be able to help them, but how do we help them without fixing them? How do we help mm. them or be there with them without judging or communicating judgment? How do we do that without losing ourselves? I think that's that tension. If you think about kids that um, our youngest daughter is adopted. So coming from the foster care world, um, having to have so many new relationships, how, having so many relationships that are unsafe, let alone what happened to bring you into the foster care world. A visual maybe that would be helpful, I think, for um, our listeners is the idea of an anchor. Now, I am not really this big person who's, you know, I've been on a boat, but I don't really know that much about it. And to show you how little I know, I was one time, a friend of ours had taken us out on the boat, a family, and he said, or as a family, and he said, hey, Robin, grab the anchor and throw it overboard. So as I do that, in the motion of tossing, he's like, wait, (laughs) because the end of the anchor wasn't tied to the boat yet. He didn't realize it was the first time out in the season. So of course the anchor (laughs) goes over and disappears because it's, you know, underwater and it's not tied to the boat. So something about an anchor apparently is very important, right? You have to have it tied to both the boat and to the anchor, to the both, both ends of the relationship. So here's the thing. We can't control both ends of the relationship, right? We can only control. So we can make sure 
that, that you've done this, but when you do drop an anchor or it, whether you're, let's say you're just out with your friends and you're going to be jumping off the boat and into the lake. And when you set your anchor, it's the whole idea of making sure that it has enough that it will hold your boat where you want it to hold, right? When the waves mm-hmm. come along or when you're swimming, that it's not going to go anywhere. So I didn't realize this, but I've done some research. And when you set your anchor, you toss it overboard and it, you make sure it's tied, of course, to the anchor in the boat. <laughs> then the idea is that you put your <laughs> boat in reverse and you have to do it till there's the right amount of tension so that you feel that pullback. So your boat can't really go and you're not doing it a hundred miles an hour, right? But you're doing it. And then when you let go, your boat should bounce back forward. And that means the anchor is set. And the whole idea was that is there's enough tension because if I drop the anchor and go, oh, it'll eventually catch on something, it doesn't always mm-hmm. catch, right? So when you think about that in a relationship, when you are the set anchor for somebody, they're going to, especially if they've had trauma in their background, they're going to try to pull away. They're going to try to see, is this anchor, is this relationship really set? Are you really going to be here for me? Now, if I'm the anchor and I'm, and I'm thinking, oh, I can't believe you keep pulling. You know what? I am done with you. I'm just going to cut my losses. Th- that's not ever going to create safety. But if you know my job is to continue to be safe, to be set in my position, it's not my job how many times the boat or the person or the relationship is going to keep pulling away. I'm the anchor. I'm going to be the steady person who is going to be here regardless of how hard you make your life or the choices that you make. That doesn't mean that I'm going to get up and say, oh, okay, well, let me go anchor us over here now and over there now. I'm going to still be firm using the analogy. Think about a wayward teen. Think mm-hmm. about a friend or a coworker who's making choices that, that are difficult. You might still say, hey, I might have to fire you. I might be the boss and I might have to say, I can't have you as an employee because of these reasons, but I'll help you find unemployment. I'll help you find another job. I'm still going to be the anchor but that doesn't mean we don't have boundaries, right? Because the anchor, it still has those boundaries and and the person could eventually back up a hundred miles an hour and break it, but that's, they're doing that. You as the anchor, you as the steady relationship, we're still there, if if that makes sense. You you know, using Mm -hmm. that kind of, um, just that that push-pull that happens in relationships that you can remain set. Uh, So I love the visual of that, of, no matter where you are, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to be, I'm going to be here kind of with you. I love that. What would you recommend to someone who's feeling that kind of push pull? At what point do we stay rooted in that dirt or rocks that are below? And at what point do we set healthy boundaries, but yet keep that connection? I look at it personally as a, as a person who's been a pastor for a lot of years, I look at it like I will always keep the door open on my end because I want you to know that I will always love you no matter, or I'll always respect you, or I'll always be there with you no matter how hard you make your life. So whether it's a, again, a a child or a coworker or a friend that may not mean that I'm going to answer your call 24 hours a day. Likely won't mean that I will come bail you out of prison if you get locked up because you were driving under the influence. Right. But it may mean that I will be a person you can call to talk to. I might still write letters to you. I might still be able to, like, I want to still be your cheerleader. But the boundaries are, part of it is about how hard, I don't ever want to work, or I can't really work harder than you are working for this relationship or for this healing to happen, right? And, and, and it's not like, oh, there's this perfect line we walk, because I might go, oh, okay, yes, I'll watch your kids while you had to go to a doctor, let's say. Mm-hmm. Well, if I do that, and then after a couple of times, oh, you didn't go to the doctor, you ended up going to the grocery store, you know, like, at some point, I might say, well, I'm not able to watch your kids next time, like, say, if I'm doing that with a friend. Um, but I will be here for you. And I might ask you, Hey, how did it go with the doctor? Oh, you didn't go. Okay. Well, let me know how it goes next time. Or if you choose to go again, in other words, I think what happens is sometimes we take it, we can go the opposite way and take it too personally. And I can say something like, you know what? That's it, Denisha. I am done trying to help you. Um, and, uh, Brene Brown says I might choose discomfort over say, not giving you money that you're asking for money, but it's better to choose discomfort in the relationship than resentment. I gave you money and you bought drugs with it, or you wasted it, or you didn't whatever I thought you said you were going to do, if that makes sense. So I, if I can quit taking it personally and, and I can say, here's what I'm willing to do or allow, 
and I will be here no matter what. Then it's up to the other person in the boat, so to speak, using the anchor analogy. They're going to pull or push or go or whatever, and, and, and they can choose to go. They're free to break that tie, but I'm going to be there. And you would be amazed at the course of, over the long term of ministry or life, people who will remember that safety and mm. will come back and say, you were there for me, even when I told you blankety, blankety, blank, or I said, I don't want to be a part of your life, uh, is with our adopted daughter. Um, right before the adoption, there, before the pandemic, she was going to school and she came home and it was just a really rough day. She said, that is it. I'm not going back to that school. You can't make me. I will probably run away. And she had run away from past homes and she had dropped out of school. So it's not that she couldn't. So my job was to help her know that I had boundaries, but I was also safe and set. So I remember using some of the, I had, that was one of those days I had to use every tool that I had in my toolbox. And I said, we will love you wherever you live. I don't know if the state of Arizona will let you live here. If you're not in school, we will still adopt you. You just may not be able to live here, but we will always be here for you. Mm. And just saying that she kind of turned and looked and she said, Oh, I guess I'll have to keep going to the school. And I remember at the time thinking, I can't believe that worked. But the reality was the principles are why it worked because I said, I will love you no matter how hard you make your life. I will be set. The boundary is that you, you have to go to school. So if you don't want to, that's okay. I will still love you. You just can't live here. And if I can say it with empathy and not get all heated and take it personally, then it's so much more powerful and it keeps the door to the relationship open, even if she had chosen to run away. That was such a good connection building moment too, because that's probably not the response perhaps that she'd experienced in the past if she'd made a threat like that, right? Because right. I mean, you are highly trained in that. <laughs> You've never taken one of Robin's love and logic classes. Oh, oh she's gosh. amazing. Well, by the grace of God. But the reality is, isn't that what we all want? Because yes. I think about with God, I think how many times does God say, Denisha, I have this amazing plan for you. You can choose it or not, but I will love you. I yes. will be here. And you might kick and scream and yell and do whatever. But in the end, God is still God. He is still on the throne. He's still good. And he is still there. And it's up to you to choose to accept that or not. You know what I mean? And God yeah. doesn't just go, oh my gosh, Denisha, this is the 17th time. He doesn't get angry like that. Or I mean, maybe eventually, I don't know. You know, I'm not trying to get into a theological discussion. But my point is, God usually responds, I love you. I will be here. I will be your anchor. You have to choose how much tension you're putting into that. Yeah. Oh, it's so good. It reminds me of Hebrews. I know in Hebrews six, it talks about, we have the hope that's an anchor to our soul and that's mm -hmm. Jesus. That's that we can go. I love that. Just that visual of, we can drive the boat back and forth. We can go a few inches and kind of root that anchor down in there, or we can take off at a hundred miles an hour. But we know when we return to that spot in the water, that God is there. Exactly. That he is there. Exactly. He is waiting for us. And that's exactly, I think so many times our perspective as I've, as I've been working with women, there's a perspective of God of, oh, now you've done it. I'm, I'm through with you. You've done the thing, whatever that thing is in their life. And they turn and they run away from God where just as that anchor holds you to that spot, mm -hmm. he's really saying, come closer come closer, right. stay right here. I've got you. I'm with you. Like he, he, the response that you gave to your daughter is just beautiful where maybe in our flesh, we'd want to say, okay, fine. You want to do that? Fine. Oh, absolutely. That's, that's what not... I want to say. <laughs> but, and that's, that's such this a beautiful example. <laughs> yes. See, you are loving as you are loved. You've been loved, right? Mm -hmm. You're loving and, her. And, with it's that hard, and that's why I think, I, I wonder what God must think. If I were God, I probably, well, I, I would have been like, that's the things I get. I'm done with you. you know? but, <laughs> but the reality is that's why I think God models that for us. And sometimes when I talk to, I was talking to someone just the other day who had done some work as, as a mentor, right? And, and, and try to be there for someone who continued to make bad choices. And does it get discouraging? Absolutely. Because I know you have all this potential. And if you would just mm -hmm. either stay away from drugs or stay in school or stop running or whatever, I know all of that potential is there but I can't make those choices for you. So what right. I can do 
is try to take care of myself so that I can be open-handed in the sense of the things that are helpful and open-hearted always so that you can push against that relationship or pull. Uh, you can do all those things, but know that I am here and I will always be here regardless of the choices you're making. But certainly those boundaries are there, right? Uh, you know, we're not going to continue to loan money to somebody who maybe isn't has them been faithful for their money, or we're not going to go and I, I would tell my kids when they were little, they would say something like, well, you, you couldn't stop us from using drugs. Absolutely. If you chose to use drugs, I'm not going to be there, but I might have to have your area searched because I wouldn't want to get in trouble for the drugs, but then I would visit you in prison, you know, and they would be like, oh my gosh, that's so stupid. I said, well, the thing is, is, you know, I can teach and I can help you see, but I can't make your choices for you. But so my good. love can stay here. The only thing I can control is my love and, and my end of the relationship, right? I can be that set anchor. Oh, Robin, I, all I can hear in that is the father's heart. Mm. That is exactly what God does, right? I can't, I can't, I'm not going to make your choices for you. You're going to make your choices, but I'm going to be here and be that anchor no matter what. Such a great example. That's, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Mm, thank you. That connection piece. Just, you know, even with, I think back when I was a teenager, when I did something wrong, I wanted to run away from my mom or my dad. I wanted to avoid, right? Because I was afraid of punishment or consequences. But really, God's offer is in that tension of do I run? Do I run? Do I back the boat up 100 miles, you know, 100 miles an hour? Or do I stay and deal? You know, that relationship, that connection piece is just so important. Sometimes we think about, consequences in love can't live side by side or boundaries in love can't live side by side. But I think in, in God's world and in a perfect world, we would do them perfectly. But the reality is they can. I can love you and tell you no. Mm. Uh, as, uh, there has been times, again, where I've had um, let somebody go from a job. I can do that in love and let the door be open for our relationship and try to encourage you, whether you accept that or not, I can't own any of those things, but it always breaks my heart so many times when relationships end over reasons, maybe that they needed to end a working relation and it's done without that empathy and love. And so the relationship is hurt on top of, you know, and the trust is hurt on top of the fact that this just wasn't a good fit for, uh, you know, a friendship or a dating relationship or an employer or a teacher student or you know, what I mean? like I think that that tension, uh, like love and respect together, can happen. But so oftentimes our own personal emotions get tied into that, and that makes it harder because we take it as a personal affront. And I think most of the time it's really less about us and more about maybe the hurt and the the need of the behavior driving that person. So if we can, it's hard, but if we can take ourselves out of that equation, we can succeed so much better, and the relationship can be so much healthier. Yeah, I have a friend who, when she was raising her daughters, two teenage daughters at the same time, uh, and as she was raising them, she gave me this visual picture that I'll never forget that goes exactly with what you just said. She said, they are on a hormonal roller coaster. <laughs> they are up, they are down, they are around. And she says, I can make the decision if I get on that roller coaster with them or if I stand back and every time they go by, I just wave and smile and, and cheer them on. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was such a great picture of keep holding that anchor, right? I'm going to be standing in this spot when you come back around the, you know, right. but not sitting with them you know, screaming and not screaming, you know, going through all of the emotions of, of the roller coaster of the teenage Absolutely. years that can or cannot happen. Oh, right? that, I mean, that is a great <laughs> visual. I, I think of teenagers as the toddlerhood of adulthood. So think about it. When your two-year-old says, yes. me, mine, I can do it by myself, you know, they're doing all those things because they're learning. So if we think of that sometimes with teenagers or even sometimes somebody young in faith might even be that way, but their, their, their attitude is they're preparing that, and, and that's how they do it. It's more painful as a teenager because they can say more hurtful things. Sometimes my daughter will, I, I think I said on the last podcast, like, don't ever make that recipe again. That was horrible. <laughs> um, she came home a couple weeks ago and, and she's great. But this one day I did not have dinner planned because she wasn't going to be home. She was going to go to the gym. And so she says she gets home. I'm on like a, a training something. And she yells from downstairs, what's for dinner? And so I text back, right? I'm finishing up. I didn't do dinner. And she literally, you had one job. And I'm like, oh my gosh. So I'm sitting there 
taking a deep breath, right? I can only control myself and I don't always do that well. But I, in this case, I was like, I'm not going to take the bait, right? She's testing the relationship. And, and so we kind of got through it and I had had some, she goes, well, when I grow up, I'm going to make better plans. Now. I'm like, well, good. I hope that that works for you. And then a couple of nights later, she didn't want to eat dinner. I'm like, well, of course, because now I made dinner. So uh-huh. I said, I jokingly said, you have one job just to eat the dinner. And and so then we can kind of have that lighthearted because you're right, those hormones go up and down. And if I get on the roller coaster and I take the bait, then none of it, nothing good is happening in that relationship. Right. So it's better. Somebody has to be stable, whether it's a friendship, whether Mm. it's any time we're with somebody who's going through a tough time, there's a difference between I can be beside you, but if I get too enmeshed in it, now I can't be the safe, steady anchor that you need me to be because now I have so much ownership that it's, I'm taking it personally that you did X or Y. So that's so true. That is such a great point. And Robin, you teach this, right? You teach this in parenting and you also teach this to organizations. Tell us a little bit about that and how we can find you. Because as I'm listening to this, I'm thinking, oh my goodness, I love your training skills. Tell us a little bit about how do, how do we find, how can we get more of Robin's wisdom and mic drops there? <laughs> I would love to have you. So I do. Um, I have been an independent facilitator of the Love and Logic curriculum since 2006. So I often do parenting classes. Most of them are virtual now. So you can join for anywhere. They're either five or six weeks. Um, and I'm listed on Eventbrite. Um, and then my website, uh, robinblumenthal.org, you can buy the book. I have other trainings that um, can come in. There's quite a few that are in that Love and Logic arena. And then quite a few that are in the trauma-informed care arena the predictive brain or understanding trauma 101 and understanding. I think the biggest thing is if we understand how trauma changes the way we look at the world, the way we enter relationships, and I can understand that most of the people around me have probably been through something that affects their behavior, Mm -hmm. that affects their choices, then it can uh, allow me to respond a little differently. I think about a rose and, you know, a rose has thorns to protect the rose, right? I mean, that's why God gave the rose thorns so that it can protect it from predators. Sometimes when I'm working with somebody, I can get trapped into focusing on the thorns, right? Dog got it. I don't know about you, but have you ever tried to get a rose and I'm like, oh, stupid rose. Yes. Bush. <laughs> God gave it to protect it. It's not really, it's not its fault that I chose to touch it without gloves and not being careful. So that it doesn't mean that we, we have to be so careful that we don't come forward, but we have to know these thorns are there. Usually a person who comes across kind of thorny, let's say, um, or extra grace required, they develop those thorns for a, a good reason. It probably mm. helped protect them from things in their past. Now they have to unlearn that. And that's a hard skill, right? Because those things protected us, but now they're holding us back. But if I sit there and yell at them, or why don't I'm just trying to help you? Why don't you trust me? Or why don't you let anybody in? That's not going to help them let down their defenses. It's only right. going to prove why they needed the defensive. So right. it has to be um, that that tension of how I can help you and be safe with that and, and, and know that they're thorns, but protect myself while helping you. That's so helpful in dealing, I think, with family members, friends, people on social media, all of that is such a, mm-hmm. such a great perspective. So if we want to learn more about that, we can go to robinblumenthal.org yes, and to get all of your good trainings and event, right? So if we look up your name on event, uh-huh. right, will we find right. that? I'll show my upcoming trainings. And then I certainly can do special trainings for an organization or a group um, by going through my website. The, the event, right ones are public ones that I have up that coming up that are just open to the general public. And then the training we're going to do here um, to kind of focus on the God and the tension is going to be May, or I'm sorry, June 16th. And that'll be on Eventbrite. God is in the tension. Uh, And I think there'll be a link um, probably you'll post on your Facebook page or in the notes for the podcast. And I would love to have people. That'll just be a conversation more like what we've had here. Yeah, and Robin is so good, not only at training, but also being able to enter to the situation. If you have a specific situation and you can kind of bring that up. I love that your trainings are interactive. They're not lecture style. She'll put you in breakout groups. You can really process through things. And yeah, so June 16th, uh, we'll put that on our Facebook page and we'll also put that in the show notes. I love partnering with you, friend. We have done five to six years, the last five or six years of huge events together and conferences here in Tucson. 
on. And I am so excited for this one on June 16th as well. And for anybody who registers for this particular training on June 16th, which again, will be in the in the show notes and also on our Facebook page, we are going to do a raffle for a free uh, book of Robins, Where in the Zoo Are You? So come and register and join us for that training and get to know Robin and the skills uh, that you have to share so many good skills. So we hope to see you there. And Robin, thank you so much for your wisdom and sharing your experience with us. It is so helpful. Oh, thank you for having me. I really enjoyed it. And I just, I love you and your ministry and I'm just honored to be a part of it. Oh, absolutely. Well, I'm excited to see how our paths are crossing in the trauma world. So I know this won't be your last visit here to the podcast. So thank you so much, Robin. And again, June 16th, check out the show notes and go to robinblumenthal.org to find more of Robin. Have a great week and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening. I pray you found hope in today's conversation and maybe even feel a little less alone in your story. Stay connected with us on Facebook and Instagram at Reclaimed Story. Want to learn more about living a reclaimed life and how you can be a part of our growing community of reclaimers? Check out our website at reclaimstory.com. All of those links and more will be in the show notes. And if you enjoyed this inspirational podcast, be sure to subscribe, rate, and review. That is a huge help in helping us reach more people to live the reclaimed life. Thank you so much for listening.